Stanford University. Great. It's uh, my distinct pleasure to introduce Mark Kahn from uh, UPenn, a great friend of mine. Uh, and, uh, you know, Mark over the years has just done incredible work uh, in many areas of vascular biology, uh, including uh, his seminal studies on lymphatic uh, venous separation with uh, SLP and SYK mutants, uh, and also his uh, work over the years in terms of uh, uh, vascular malformations in the brain, for which he has uh, several recent Nature papers. Um, in addition to all of this, uh, Mark has uh, also been an active uh, coronary care unit attending and practicing cardiologist, uh, so really a uh, model uh, physician scientist. I've been bugging Mark for years to come out to Stanford to give a talk, so it's uh, really happy that uh, he could take the time to join us. And his talk today will be on mechanism and therapy for cerebral cavernous malformation. Thank you, Mark. Okay. I think I would just... uh, thanks, Calvin. I'm very impressed by the attendance at this this meeting, and I think I took a few pictures to show I can show the people at Penn that we also need food for our conferences. Whoops. <laughs> Good here. Did but small. Ah, great. Okay. Okay, so we're going to talk today about one disease entity, and although it's not a clinical conference, I thought a disease is a disease, it's good to meet a patient. So here's a patient that I didn't see but was reported in New England Journal of Medicine. A 51-year-old fellow, had a one-year history of progressive and worsening headaches, a pretty normal neuro exam. His skin exam revealed some hyperkeratotic papules and, and bluish nodular lesions. And there was a family history with a similar uh, cutaneous phenotype. And then the MRI was a very characteristic MRI for this disease. And this is what it looked like. This is an axial MRI. And you can see a large number of these face occupying lesions. And what this is, these are filled with blood. Each one of these is what's called a cavernoma, or a cerebral cavernous malformation. And, and of course, this patient uh, went on to be uh, diagnosed genetically as well as by MRI and uh, was found to have a mutation in a gene that we'll talk about a little bit today, CCM1, also known as CRIP1. And the most important thing is that although, you know, the diagnosis was state-of-the-art, the, uh, the imaging was state-of-the-art, there wasn't any state-of-the-art treatment. There were too many lesions to remove uh, surgically although we can occasionally do that for patients with retract, uh, un terrible seizures. There was some mild relief of headaches with beta blockers, and over time, things got worse. And this is very uh, uh, typical of this disease. In this case, it was progressive cognitive decline and memory deficits, although in most cases, it's actual uh, strokes and seizures that the patients present with. And this is another familial patient with severe disease. So cerebral cavernous malformation is pre relatively common. Um, you know, this is the prevalence based on autopsy studies. The more relevant number is that we have about 200,000 people that we know about in the U.S. now who have had strokes due to this disease. And there are many patients uh, probably who are asymptomatic. And, and this is an unusual vascular disease because it only affects the central nervous system, although you, you heard about the cutaneous papules in, in that patient. They may also be uh, related to that. And there's no uh, treatment for the disease. At the moment, standard of care is uh, symptomatic treatment for seizures and neurosurgical resection of particularly bad lesions. Now, the clinicians have known about this disease for quite a long time. In fact, when my student, who's the first author on some of these papers, recently uh, graduated, we found uh, the first report from 1936. And what they found is that there are, you know, before any of the genetics or any of the molecular insights, they thought there were two forms of the disease, familial and uh, sporadic. And, and this familial cases were a minority, only about 20%. And they had an autosomal dominant mechanism of inheritance, which we now know to be due to loss of heterozygosity, and specifically in endothelial cells. And they presented with very large numbers of lesions, typically tens to hundreds of lesions. And this, they were also notable for having an early onset of disease. The sporadic patients had, you know, the majority of patients. They were not inherited, but the lesions looked identical in character 
and often uh, in, in complication to those of the familial cases. And typically these patients were older at the time of onset. Now there's a couple, the one thing I'd like to point out that's relevant to, you know, some of the science that I'll tell you about in a moment, is that clinically, from the beginning, this was a very strange type of a genetic disease. Uh, as you'll see, we've identified the, the, mutate, the causal genes, and we know what the phenotype looks like. But there's a very poor relationship or correlation between genotype and phenotype in this disease. Many patients who have identical genotypes will have very varied phenotypes. Some will have terrible seizures and strokes as infants. Others will go their entire lives, get an MRI at the age of 70, and have no lesions at all. And so this unpredictable natural history has been something that, of a mystery in this disease. Okay, so a couple of questions. Uh, the first is, uh, this is a loss of function in a number of genes causing this disease, uh, CCM1 or CRIT1, CCM2, and CCM3 or PDCD10. How does this loss of function confer an autosomal dominant uh, disorder? And then this, this remarkable genotype, phenotype, lack of correlation. And I really like this quote from Elizabeth Turnier Lesserve. It's not written down anywhere. This was at one of the early meetings on the disease. But she said it's a disease without a natural history. Okay. So uh, today we'll talk about the disease in, in three different chapters, and, and you can follow some of this in published work if, you, if, you, if you're interested. And the first chapter is uh, one in which we used basic uh, organisms and basic approaches in, in developing heart to get at um, molecular insight. In, in, and this was important because like many diseases, we could identify the molecular players and we could identify the disease in patients but we could not connect how one was relating to the other. Um, and then in the second chapter, I'll show you work that we did that extended from this developmental system using fish and mice to a mouse model of disease to further nail down the mechanism and relate some of the clinical findings that clinicians had, had established over many decades to, uh, to molecular um, concepts. And then in the final chapter, I'll tell you about how this work led unexpectedly to an insight into the pathogenesis of the disease that explains the poor relationship between genotype and phenotype and that we think is related to the fact that the microbiome and activation of innate immune signaling is a key driver of the disease pathogenesis. Okay, first chapter done by Xenon Zhao, a PhD student now up at Boston doing his postdoc. Dave Ronzi, combined degree student now at WashU doing his uh, clinical work. So this is what the genes encode. They encode three proteins. We don't need to go into the molecular characteristics of these proteins other than to say that they, they contain domains that allow them to bind each other as a single complex. And that explains, again, this, this observation that patients with mutations in any of these genes present with an identical disease. And this complex sits in the cytoplasm, but there's no enzymatic activity to any of these proteins. And it hasn't been clear how loss of function of this complex results in any disease. But, you know, anyone in science knows that the lack of data doesn't result in a lack of hypotheses. So there have been many different signaling pathways that have been connected to CCM uh, complex function and uh, many uh, even pharmacologic approaches that have been actually studied in patients to see if they would um, reverse the disease. But most of this is without a lot of um, uh, sound, you know, biology behind it. This is just a quote from Chekhov reminding me that if you, uh, if you have that many proposed mechanisms, you really don't know what's going on. So this is where we started back in 2009 with Ben Cleveland, a combined degree student in the lab. Uh, he knocked out CCM2 in the endothelium. And what he saw was that the, the mice all died by about E9.5. And that was because they didn't establish blood circulation. And the reason for that was a requirement in the endothelium to create this structure called a branchial arch artery which connects the developing heart to the developing aorta. And when they didn't, didn't form in these animals, the heart would pump, but the blood couldn't go anywhere. And, and Sheng Zhang Zheng saw the same phenotype when we uh, knocked down uh, CCM genes in the zebrafish. So this was very nice. It showed us that there was an endothelial requirement for the pathway. That was an important step. But you know these early lethal phenotypes really precluded a lot of insight into disease mechanism. So we're looking for a way to kind of hone things down more tightly. So what we next did was use a, uh, a Cree developed by Binzow at Einstein that allowed us to delete the pathway only in the endocardium of the heart. Christy knows all about this Cree. 
And, and what we found was when we deleted the, uh, this is in, in this case the CCM1 gene in the endocardium, that the animals would die, but they would die later in mid-gestation, about 12.5 to 14.5. And when we looked at 10.5, what you'll see in the normal heart is that you have endocardium, and underneath it is myocardium, this, this, this pink cell. And in between the two is a lot of space on the H&E uh, slide. And what that space is, is proteoglycan containing matrix known as cardiac jelly. And we know that that's important for heart development. And when we looked at the CCM1 endocardial knockout, we still had endocardium and myocardium, although myocardium is thinner. But the most important difference that we noted was the absence of this space and the absence of that jelly. And we quantitated the jelly by looking with antibody to the, the primary protein, which is Versican. And of course, that's reduced in the knockout relative to the uh, lunamate control. OK, so this was a, a, a first kind of specific molecular clue. And that's what you're looking for to kind of get a toehold in, in your investigation. We knew now that there was some requirement for this complex related to uh, for cardiac jelly, and that the loss of the complex would lead to the loss of the jelly. But we still had no idea how. So we did a gene expression analysis. And when we took these hearts out, and then the endothelium is about 50% of the transcript in the heart at this time point, a remarkably simple picture uh, appeared. First, we saw a high level of Adam TS5. This is a metalloprotease that is known to degrade Versican, the primary protein in cardiac jelly. So that made sense. And then all of these red arrows are targets or actual uh, genes that encode KLF2 and KLF4. These are two related transcription factors that, you know, fortuitously the lab had been working on for quite some time in the context of other aspects of vascular development and function, especially uh, response to fluid shear. So we looked at this in vivo, and indeed the levels of KLF2 shown here by in situ were very high. KLF4, easier to appreciate because we have a nice antibody. It's this nuclear stain. If you look at the endocardial cells in the knockout, you can see very strong green nuclear staining for KLF4. It's much weaker in the control animal. OK, so that was interesting. And now we could go back to the fish where you can manipulate gene expression much more, uh, much more quickly to see if there was any causal relationship between these gene expression changes and this phenotype. Now, in the fish, when you take away the CCM uh, genes, you end up with a very dilated heart. And the heart of the fish is over here. And, this is, and when you look at it you know, uh, with a, with a uh, fluorescent marker, it appears to be a large dilated heart. When we knocked down KLF2, we were able to restore normal heart size. And we could do the same thing when we knocked down Adam TS5. So that was useful. And it established a sort of causal relationship between these changes in gene expression and, and the actual uh, loss of the complex. So now we had a little more molecular information. If we lost this complex, there was somehow a change in KLF2 and 4 transcription factor expression, an increase. And that resulted in metalloprotease expression that would degrade the cardiac jelly, <coughs> resulting in cardiac defects. So now we needed to sort of connect these dots and try and figure out how this was all taking place. And the literature proved to be you know, very helpful at this point in time. So as I told you, we've been working on KLF2 for some period of time in the context of fluid shear. And in that context, it was known to be downstream of MEK5 and ERK5 which is part of a MAP kinase pathway regulated at the top by the primary MAP kinase, MEKK3. Now, MEKK3 had actually been identified, uh, had actually been shown to be a direct binding partner for CCM2 back in when Gary Johnson was examining MEKK and MAP kinase activities in 2003. And this was even before CCM2 was positionally cloned in human patients as a CCM disease gene. He actually called the gene OSM. And this had been sitting in the literature for quite a long period of time, but its significance not really uh, evident. So the obvious hypothesis was that this interaction led to a change in this signaling pathway, resulting in a change in the KLF2 uh, expression. And, and the inputs to this signaling pathway have known, been known to be shear stress in the endothelium and in many cell types, uh, cytokines. OK. So we then, we, you know, armed with this kind of information from the literature, we went back and we, we again, approached this in the fish. The control fish has a nice a small heart. You take away CCM1 and the heart dilates. And now if we reduce the MEKK3 levels with an MEKK3 morpholino, we could again restore uh, the normal heart size. So this suggested that there was a causal relationship. And we were able to show this also in the mouse 
although you know it's a little more difficult. In this case, we're knocking out CCM1, but not changing the level of MEKK3. And again, you see this loss of cardiac jelly, which also results in loss of alcyon blue staining or versicam protein. And if you take away one of the two alleles of MEKK3 in the endocardium at the same time that we remove CCM1, you can restore quite a bit of the cardiac jelly and the versicam. And these animals live longer, although they don't survive to birth, than these animals. Okay, so that stuff uh, was very nice, and it, it allowed us to sort of use genetics in the mouse, genetics in the fish, known molecular relationships from previous studies that were totally unrelated, such as a yeast 2 hybrid screen done by Gary Johnson more than a decade before, to come up with at least a mechanism in the heart. And what we now thought was going on was that the CCM complex was needed to regulate, negatively regulate, this MEKK3 MAP kinase. The loss of the complex would be sort of a loss of a break on this MAP kinase pathway. It would go into overdrive, express too much KLF2 and 4, too much Adam TS protein that would degrade versican and, and, and proteoglycan, and then you would lose cardiac jelly and, and disrupt cardiac development. And, and this was, you know, a nice insight in the heart. And the question was whether we could take this information and, and understand more about the disease. So this is the mechanism where it binds MEKK3 and is required to regulate it. Loss of the CCM complex and loss of the repression activates these transcription factors. Could that also be the basis for uh, lesion formation in, in humans? And the next work, and, and all the work I'll show you from now on, was per, uh, contributed by Alan Tang, combined degree student, very talented in my laboratory, and also Xenon, who I introduced you to earlier. Okay, so now we're lucky because, you know, there's a good animal model for this disease, and that's really essential when you're taking this approach to understand a disease mechanism. This is a picture of the surface of a human brain. This patient is uh, being operated on by Dr. Isam Awad, one of our collaborators, and, and this, this, this lesion is going to be removed to uh, help uh, prevent a seizure. Uh, and this, uh, these are lesions that are induced in the mouse when you delete, in this case, the CCM2 gene only in the endothelial cells of the animal immediately after birth. And they develop very large lesions in the hindbrain. You can see them kind of visually here and microscopically here. And these lesions look, you know, very similar and probably are almost identical to those that we see in human patients. So we took a look at the hindbrain endothelium after deleting uh, the CCM genes. And indeed, what we saw was an increase in KLF2, an increase in KLF4. Um, we, we didn't see an increase in ADAMTS5, but we did see an increase in ADAMTS4, a related um, metalloprotease. So at least at the molecular level, there was some conservation between the developing heart endocardium and the uh, postnatal brain endothelium. <laughs> And we needed to sort of score these lesions in a, in a quantitative and objective manner. And, and what Alan and Xenon developed was a method using micro CT imaging. This is the micro CT of the brain. And, and, what, we, and what, we've, what we're imaged here are these lesions in an animal in which we've only deleted the CCM1 gene. And you can see very large number of lesions and we can quantitate this in a blinded manner. Um, and then when we removed one allele of MEKK3 in the parallel experiment to the one I showed you in the developing heart, you can see an almost complete reversal of the phenotype and prevention of CCM formation in these animals. And indeed, these, uh, this is the quantitative uh, lesion uh, numbers. They go to almost zero. Um, the animals that you know, delete CCM1 in the endothelium after birth are almost all dead by uh, 40 days after birth. And if you remove one MEKK3 allele, you restore survival to, to normal, and these animals remain healthy for life. So this suggested that at least um, uh, there, there was a conservation of mechanism, and MEKK3 was indeed playing a key role. Okay, now we looked again at the, these, you know, putative pathologic gene expression changes, and, and they were reversed. KLF2 is back down to normal, so is KLF4, and so is the Adam TS4 uh, metalloprotease. And we went on and showed that KLF2 and 4 are indeed causal. If you remove one allele of KLF2 or two alleles of KLF2, you can prevent most or all of CCM formation in these animals. The same is true for KLF4. I won't show you those data. And then maybe the most important thing was when we looked at the uh, at human patients, uh, these are uh, pieces of human, slices from human brain. 
These are uh, from brain that was removed for seizures unrelated to CCM disease. The endothelium here is shown in red. Um, the green is just autofluorescence uh, of the red blood cells. And we're staining for KLF4, the uh, transcription factor I showed you staining in the heart earlier. And you don't really see any nuclear staining in these endothelial cells. If you look at the um, brain from familial patients with mutations in CCM1 or CCM3, there's really a very up, strong upregulation of the uh, CCM, uh, of the KLF4 uh, transcription factor in these, in these lesions. And then what was very interesting was that if we looked at sporadic lesions, these are two patients who, you know, for whom there was no molecular or genetic information, but they presented with large CCMs. They were removed for, uh, for clinical reasons. And we could see the same high level of KLF4 and also KLF2 uh, in, these, uh, in these sporadic patients. This is the KLF2 staining, which is not quite as good as the KLF4. So that suggested that not only was the pathway conserved, in terms of its function in the endothelium between the developing heart and the postnatal brain and the mouse, but that these molecular changes were observed in the patients, and both in the patients who had familial disease and the patients who had no genetic history, but developed the disease uh, on a sporadic basis. And then a final sort of biochemical approach that Alan took was to uh, look for a, a actual break in the connection between the CCM complex and the MEKK3 MAP kinase. And, what he, and the way he did this was he went through the literature to find uh, patients who had mutations in the gene encoding CCM2, which is the, the protein that binds MEKK3. And he found a patient, uh, a family, in which there was a mutation that uh, conferred an early, a premature stop, but at the very C-terminal end of the protein. And we knew that the, this, the uh, binding to CCM1 and CCM3 was mediated by the PTB domain and this uh, intervening space spacer domain, but that this helical hormonin domain was important for binding to MEKK3. So the prediction was that these patients had the disease not because they had lost the CCM complex, but because they had lost the ability of the CCM complex to directly bind and regulate MEKK3. And indeed, he showed this biochemically. If you express these proteins and then pull down MEKK3, the wild type protein can pull down MEKK3. The mutant protein can maybe a faint amount, but almost no MEKK3 binding. And yet both proteins interact very well with CCM1 and CCM3 in a co-IP. So the defect in this family, we believe, is not an inability to create the CCM complex, but an inability of that complex to interface with and regulate MEKK3. OK, so at this point, what we knew was that the, the mechanism appeared to be regulation of this MAP kinase pathway and these transcription factors. Uh, we can talk later. We think that the Adam TS proteases may play an important role. OK, um, now these were valuable insights. Uh, they led to new questions about mechanism. Um, what's the final effector that is uh, resulting in malformation, in, in vascular malformation? Why do these, why do these uh, malformations form only in the central nervous system, even in animals in which we're deleting the pathway entirely in, in all of the uh, endothelial cells? And then, the, the question that uh, the next chapter will address is, if the role of the CCM complex is to put a break on this MAP kinase, what, what is it breaking? What's activating this MAP kinase? What's, what are the native signals that are driving it? And you know, what's the biology that the complex uh, has evolved to control? And, and there are also important clinical or translational questions. You know, we, it's not so easy to develop antagonists to MAP kinases. They have almost identical enzymatic, you know, kinase domains, and, and trans KLF2 and 4 transcription factors are also challenging targets. You know, we thought if we could identify more mechanism, there might be more viable therapeutic targets. Okay, so the last chapter is the work of Alan Tang. And it will address this question of what activates this pathway um, if the role of the CCM complex is to negatively regulate it. And, and like a lot of interesting things in science, we did not set out to actually answer this question. But we got unlucky, and then we got lucky. And, 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 and the way we got unlucky was, well, at least from this perspective, we moved from one building at Penn to a new building at Penn. <laughs> and when we did so, we moved into a new vivarium, or a new animal facility. And we've been there for a few months trying to finish off some of the prior work when you know, we began to notice this very unsettling phenomenon. 
And, and that was that animals, that the colonies that used to form very robust lesions at 10 days after birth, following induced deletion of the gene in endothelial cells, animals we call it susceptible, were now um, generating litters in which all, all of the litter mates look like this. There are virtually no lesions. So these animals were resistant or uh, very different. And, and we could quantitate this, uh, and this, and, and this spread from it was first noted in the CCM2 colony, then it went to the CCM1 colony, and this is uh, you know what it looked like is really an all or none phenomenon, in which uh, you know there's a big spread, but all these animals have uh, large numbers of lesions with a sizable volume, and these are animals from litters that were resistant, and and their volume was virtually nil, so there there was this very powerful uh, change. Now we thought maybe there'd been some genetic drift, although these were the same colonies that we'd had at the original BRB building. So we back-crossed CCM2 animals onto uh, Black 6 for seven generations because we knew that was a susceptible strain from original reports that we and others had made and, and, and changed nothing. The animals remained resistant even when they were on a pure strain background. So we, we thought this was a non-genetic environmental factor, but we really had no idea what was going on. And then we got some clues, and, and the first clue was, and the, and the major clue was, we would occasionally get litters where al almost all the litter mates or all the litter mates looked like, uh, like this. They were resistant, and then one animal might have one or a large number of lesions. And the animal that would have a lesion invariably had an abscess in the peritoneum. And this abscess is because the way we would induce gene deletion in these animals is to inject them, and we would actually try to inject them into the stomach. And one of the reasons we were doing this is we were convinced that we had to optimize our tamoxifen-induced deletion in order to make sure that this you know, make sure that wasn't a reason for the resistance phenomenon. And as we did that, the needle would pass through the bowel on occasion. Bacteria would be released into the into the abdominal space, and an abscess would form, a bacterial abscess. And in fact. Uh, this gram stain was performed by my MD PhD student. It's probably the only gram stain he'll ever perform. And, but it showed that this was a gram negative abscess, like a typical abscess that patients and, and humans might get. And so we decided to do this on purpose. And, and, and we took animals that were uh, from resistant parts of the colony, and we injected them with Bacteroides fragilis, which is a gram negative organism known to cause human uh, peritoneal abscess. And we found that many of these animals then became highly susceptible with large numbers of lesions. But there were quite a few, uh, maybe a bit less than half, that were still uh, resistant. And then we called these responders and these non-responders. And when we looked at this, and this is the quantitative volume, you, know, you went to a pretty good number of animals that had sizable volumes of CCM lesions, but then a large number that had clear abscesses but no, no lesions. And, and, and the difference was that um, spleen weight. And, and the, if the animals had enlarged spleens, they had um, a phenotype that had showed CCM lesions. And if they didn't, they, there were no lesions. And when we looked at the spleens, what we saw was that the spleen weight was reflective of bacteremia, bacteria that had managed to escape the abscess site in the abdomen, enter the blood. And then, of course, everything in the blood gets filtered by the spleen. Calvin can tell you more about that than I. And, 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 and they ended up with uh, micro and macro abscesses in the spleen. So this was actually a pretty valuable um, uh, result. Again, you know, a serendipitous result, but one that was very informative. Because what it said was that this isn't action at a distance. Having an abscess in your abdomen does not, by some magic, allow you to form a malformation in your brain. Instead, the bacteria have to escape the abdomen and enter the blood. And if they don't enter the blood, you don't get a vascular malformation. So that suggested that um, there was a direct connection for these bacteria to the endothelial pathway that we were studying. And, and, and this went back again to the literature. This is work from uh, Bing Su, uh, Im, uh, immunologist at Yale. He generated the first MEKK3 knockout animals and made deficient um, embryonic fibroblasts. And what he noted was that these fibroblasts were unable to respond to lipopolysaccharide, which is a major component of the of the uh, cell wall of the gram-negative bacteria, and that this could be restored by restoring MEKK3. So the hypothesis became one that was remarkably simple, and that gram-negative bacteria that got into the blood could activate TLR4 signaling um, in endothelial cells through uh, lipopolysaccharide 
and that became our, our next sort of hypothesis to test. And the hypothesis was that the upstream activator, at least in this mouse model, was primarily TLR4 receptors, which is the innate immune receptor for a lipopolysaccharide, and that that was the primary input to MEKK3, and that loss of this you know, uh, negative re uh, regulation of MEKK3 would allow excess activation of the, of the pathway, but that the primary stimulant might be TLR4. Okay, so we went and began to look at this more directly. First, you know, if this is all true, then we should be able to short circuit the whole thing and just give the animals minute amounts of LPS. And in fact, this is extremely minute to prevent tachyphylaxis. And we found that all resistant animals, when given minute amounts of LPS, develop massive lesions. So that could, that, that circumvented all resistance. And if you didn't have CCM deficiency, you didn't develop any lesions. So this wasn't something that LPS can do by itself. It can only do it in the setting of uh, endothelial deficiency. And then we gave just one small amount of LPS at P5, knowing that from previous studies, we could see the first lesions in, at P6. And when we did that, we could show that lesion formation could happen in you know, a time as short as 24 hours. One, 24 hours later, we could see the onset of lesion formation um, in, the, uh, in this hindbrain, suggesting this was a very, very rapid, maybe a, a direct mechanism. So we looked again at the endothelial cells from the hindbrain of these animals. As I showed you earlier, if you have a CCM deficiency state, like in this case, CRIT1, uh, KLF2 and KLF4 go up. If you give LPS to, and this is a very low dose again, to uh, healthy animals, there's really no change in these transcription factors. But if you give LPS to the CCM deficient animal, then you get a synergistic increase in these, in these transcription factors. And we know these are the causal transcription factors. So the, hypothesis, so the question now became, you know, what is the, is it LPS that's activating this pathway? And if so, is this all going through TLR4 and TLR4 on the endothelium itself? And so we could go back to the same rescue strategy that I showed you earlier for MEKK3 and the KLFs. And in this case, we do a deletion of CCM1. These are in a susceptible uh, uh, colony. And you can see we get a nice uh, lesion formation in these animals. If we take away um, in the endothelium only, one allele of TLR4, there's a significant reduction. If we take away both alleles, it's gone completely, and this is the quantitation. So lesion formation absolutely requires endothelial TLR4 receptor in the mouse. Okay, so at this point we had a lot of very intriguing data, but stuff that was a little well, unsettling because it pointed to endothelial TLR4 receptors in, in neonatal animals, and, and you know, one could wonder whether this is an accurate representation of the human disease, you know, that typically arises in, in adult patients. So we, we um, were fortunate. We began to collaborate with um, Helen Kim and Leslie um, <coughs> Morrison at the, uh, at, um, in, in UCSF in New Mexico. And what Helen and Leslie had been doing was taking a look at a very specific group of patients in New Mexico all of whom had an identical mutation in CCM1. And this is from a founder effect from a Hispanic settler there a couple hundred years ago. And, and, and again, as I mentioned earlier, it was known that these patients, although they had identical genotypes at the disease locus, had remarkably varying phenotypes, some with severe disease, some with no disease. And they were taking a classic human genetic approach, and they were asking whether a GWAS study, you know, to look at polymorphisms, might identify genes that were, um, contributing to disease penetrance and severity. And they looked at a large number of genes, and, and remarkably, the only thing that they found that was significant was a polymorphism in TLR4 and a polymorphism in CD14. And CD14 encodes a protein that acts as a co-receptor um, required to, for, to help um, LPS be loaded onto uh, TLR4. And so Alan uh, looked more carefully at these polymorphisms and what he found was that they were both located in the 5' prime genomic region for each gene, and that they were actually um, cis EQTLs that changed the expression level of the gene. And in fact, they increased the levels. If you looked, we looked at the leukocytes from hundreds of patients uh, in collaboration with our collaborators in Europe. And we could show that if, as, as the number of these uh, polymorphisms <coughs> rose in the two sites, you could get an increase in TLR4 and an increase in um, CD14 expression. And this was very uh, interesting because previous work by uh, Maria Freudenberg's group 
had shown in mice that there's this linear relationship between the levels of TLR4 that animals express and the uh, amount of IL-6 or TLR4 signaling that they exhibit in response to a known LPS challenge. So this all made sense. And it suggested that in humans, as well as in mice, TLR4 might be a very central player. We took a closer look at, at, these, at our patients, and what we found is that you, as you increase the number of risk alleles, there was a, a, um, a, an increase in the number of CCMs in these patients. This is actually the actual data in terms of um, adjusted lesion burden. Okay, so this all led to a mechanism in which the major player for the activation of the pathway was TLR4 and the major ligand was LPS. So where's the LPS coming from in, in humans who are not being injected with tamoxifen and subjected to the experimental procedures that the mice are? Um, so is it gut bacteria, which is where um, almost all of our gram-negative bacteria are to be found? And so we then went back to the mice and uh, we asked whether um, you require, they required gut bacteria to develop uh, their phenotype. And we did this in a germ-free experiment. We took susceptible animals and we uh, did time matings. And at just before the time of birth, they were uh, harvested by sterile C-section and then fostered to either conventional moms or germ-free moms. And what we found was that when harvested to uh, sorry, fostered to conventional moms, they developed large numbers of lesions. And germ-free animals, most seven out of the eight germ-free animals developed little or no lesion formation, but we did have a true outlier. And this animal had a large number of lesions. You can see the lesion volume up there. But as far as we can tell, it did not have a significant number of bacteria. So this suggests that while bacteria are very important in the pathogenesis of this disease in this neonatal model, it's not the only mechanism. And we can discuss that later if people are interested. Okay, so now we can go back to this very, the first observation, which is the emergence of this resistance phenomenon, shown here again in the CCM1 and CCM2 animals. The susceptible animals develop lots of lesions, the resistant animals develop almost none, and there's really no difference based on, on genotype. So we then sequenced the bacteria in their gut, which is a very straightforward thing to do nowadays, and we were happy to have the uh, collaboration from a microbiome center that had been established at Penn. And what we found was, when we looked at this uh, coordinate analysis, was that the, 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 the biomes fractionated not according to genotype, but as you might expect, according to whether the animals were resistant or susceptible to CCM formation. And when we looked at the, the, the different types of bacteria that were present in these two uh, groups, the, the major difference seemed to be in one group of gram-negative uh, bacteria called S24-7, Bacteroidetes S24-7, and that animals with higher levels of S24-7, about two or three-fold higher minimum, would have disease, while animals that fell below that threshold would appear resistant and not develop the disease. And it's a pretty, you know, now we don't have this bacteria, but in the mice it's a pretty interesting bacteria because it's considered collidogenic. This is a study uh, from Richard Flavel's group in which they, they pulled down immunoglobulin A, which which, bind, which is a secreted immunoglobulin in the gut, and they asked what bacteria come down most commonly with this, with this uh, immunoglobulin, and, the, and, and it's sort of a way of asking what bacteria are closest to the, to the bowel wall and, and closest to getting through the epithelial barrier. And number one on the list was indeed the S27, S24-7 family. So the hypothesis we have at this point, the working model is one in which the actual, at the endothelial cell, the role of the CCM complex is to negatively regulate this MAP kinase pathway. But that, interestingly, the MAP kinase pathway input in, in, uh, in the brain endothelium seems to be primarily driven by LPS from gram-negative bacteria and signaling through the TLR4 receptor. And that the contribution of the microbiome, we believe, is by having different organisms with greater or lesser ability to um, provide LPS that can get through this gut barrier and into the blood and therefore access the endothelial TLF4 receptors. Okay, so I'll finish with just a few thoughts on whether this is going to help us in any way get to therapy. Um, there are two obvious approaches based on the new information. Uh, one is to see if it, to block TLR4 signaling and the other is to alter the microbiome. Okay, so let's take a look at TLR4. This turned out to be very straightforward. Uh, TLR4 signaling has been a target uh, pharmacologically uh, to try and help patients 
with uh, sepsis, uh, and there have been a number of drugs. TAC-242 uh, blocks TLR4 signaling from uh, binding to the intracellular uh, part of the molecule, and LPS-RS is a form of LPS that can actually bind uh, the co-receptors for TLR4, but not activate the, uh, the receptor itself. And this is analogous to an FDA-approved drug, Aritaran. And what we found was that both drugs were pretty effective at preventing uh, CCM formation in this neonatal model. These are the animals that are given vehicle, and these are the animals given TAC-242. Very significant reduction, and a very similar uh, reduction with the LPS-RS. So blocking TLR4 certainly works, and that's not surprising given the TLR4 genetics that we looked at. What about altering the microbiome? Because this is a much more attractive option for patients who have a lifelong disease in which, you know, risk is not defined to a number of days or, or weeks, but actually, you know, months and years. So uh, we performed this sort of longitudinal experiment, and in this experiment, Alan took susceptible animals, and these were distinct male-female pairs, the same male-female pair. And they, so they, um, they were mated, and, and the first generation of offspring was examined and, 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 and quantitated for CCM formation. We then mated them again, and this time mom was treated with antibiotics from mid-gestation until the time that we sacrificed pups, and we looked at CCM formation in generation two, which was given maternal antibiotics. And then after this, we simply stopped the antibiotics, and we mated the animals a third time four to six weeks later, and took a look at generation three. And the idea was that we would have a bacterial load that would go from normal to almost nothing and back to normal. But in our new animal facility, it appeared that the default microbiome was a resistant microbiome. But the question was, rather than having this take place over multiple generations, could we take the same animals and convert them from a resistant, uh, from a susceptible to a resistant microbiome? And indeed, it's very, very effective to do this. So this is what the animals exhibit uh, in terms of phenotype when they have no antibiotic treatment and have a susceptible microbiome. Antibiotics are much better than um, germ-free conditions. We can get uh, a com almost complete lesion um, resolution with antibiotics. And then post-antibiotics, no lesions. Again, um, a resistant microbiome. And this is just an examination of the microbiome. The number of bacteria, of course, go back to normal in this third generation but the, the S24-7 levels are uh, significantly reduced once the microbiome is altered, and that corresponds to protection from the disease. So the hypothesis we now have is that it's not just the amount of bacteria that you have in your, in your gut that will alter your risk or, or predict your risk, but it's a qualitative aspect, too. And the type of bacteria and, 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 and what kind of microbiome you harbor may be what is explaining the correlation between genotype and phenotype in, in human patients. And I'm, I'll just leave you with a, a few teasers about this, because we're, we're studying this actively now. And the, the, the only teaser is from Leslie and Helen's data, where for reasons that are not so clear, they decided to look at just classic cardiovascular risk factors in their uh, New Mexico CCM cohort. And they looked at, you know, sex, obesity, diabetes, blood pressure, um, cholesterol, smoking, and they only found one factor that correlated quite strongly with risk, and it was obesity, but it correlated in, in, in an inverse manner to what they might have thought. The more obese the patient, the less likely that patient was to get disease. Not more likely, but less likely. And this is what, you know, the relationship between BMI and, and lesion count looks like. In, 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 in all patients over 18, and this is in patients from 18 to 60. So a pretty strong correlation. Now, we don't really know the mechanism for this, but we are speculating that it relates to work done by Jeff Gordon's group and, and some others a few years ago in which they looked at both humans and mice, and they found that when, when that lean humans and mice had high gram-negative uh, microbiomes, while obese humans and mice had relatively high gram positive and low gram negative biomes. And in fact, if you take a humans and, or, or mice, but this is, these are human data, and you put them on a, on a diet, as they become leaner, their microbiome shifts and becomes more gram negative. And then when they go off the diet, it becomes gram positive again. 
So the hypothesis we have is that the protective effect of obesity is because it's actually altering the microbiome. And there's another piece of evidence that if we alter the biome, we can uh, alter the um, disease risk in these patients. And so that's kind of where we're going now. Um, our first uh, order of business is to understand the role of the microbiome in, in the human disease. It sounds a little more straightforward than it is. Uh, it's the first human work my lab's done. It turns out to be quite difficult, even though all it amounts to right now is getting fecal samples from patients all over the country who have been characterized at the genotype and phenotype level. And we're going to look at the, 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 their microbiome the way we did uh, in the mice. And, and we're hoping to correlate, um, you know, the severity of the, bi uh, of the, uh, of the disease with different um, microbiomes and, and specifically, you know, identify protective versus susceptible um, or, you know, or, or pathogenic microbiome components. And that will be very interesting because if it works, fecal transplant for these patients is not an unreasonable approach. Um, other future directions that we can talk about if people have questions, where we think that the gut barrier is an important component here, probably the mechanism by which the biome is exerting its effects. And then, of course, we still need to understand at the endothelial level why these caverns are forming and why they're so specific to the central nervous system. And I, I've mentioned just about everybody here. Uh, Alan Tang's really done uh, the lion's share of the work. We've had a lot of good collaborators that I've mentioned as well. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, so the question is whether um, we've looked at sources of LPS other than the, like the gut, which would be something like the mouth, yeah. and, 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 you know, whether the microbiome could be acting not just through LPS but through changing the whole cytokine environment. So we thought about, you know, it is important to think about the mouth and other sources, but to be honest, it's so complicated getting samples from humans that, we, you know, we started out with grand schemes and now we're just lucky to get a piece of poop in the mail. So um, we, we've restricted our ambition to something that we think is feasible because our biggest worry actually is just power. We think the human microbiome, of course, will be much more heterogeneous and diverse than mice that all live together and eat each other's poop. Um, and so, you know, it, there's a sort of statistical challenge there. Will we get the power that we need to, to you know, resolve differences in biome? Um, and the, the, certainly the cytokines are important. I think that's why we saw an animal in the germ-free group that had disease. And, and it, it, I'm, I'm sure that some patients will have disease that is not related directly to microbiome, but to other reasons, you know, and other for having a high cytokine level. Yeah. So the question is whether, you know, we see a relationship between disease, outcome or severity, and, and nutrition or, um, and, and, you know, most the patients that we've looked at so far have all been in the U.S. Uh, you know, we don't have a lot of malnutrition, um, even in New Mexico. And, and so I, I think that's very interesting. But, you know, the, what we really need to understand these patients, of course, is sophisticated medical imaging like these MRIs and also genetic evidence that they have a familial disease. So this is going to restrict our analysis to a pretty, you know, pretty high-level group. I don't, I don't know if we'll have the opportunity to do that, but, it, but that would be interesting. Christy? Yeah, we think it is. Um, actually, it's a very interesting question that we've kind of pursued a little bit in the lab. So sort of one hypothesis would be that 
Well, it goes back to what's the upstream um, activator of the pathway that, that, that is important. You know, in these postnatal animals, the microbiome is present and clearly a dominant, you know, force. But in the prenatal animal, that's probably not the case. We think they're actually hemodynamic forces could be what determines the timing to get rid of jelly. As hemodynamic forces rise in the, you know, in the growing heart, that that might be the cue that drives enough MEKK3 signaling, KLF24 expression, ADAMTS expression to begin to degrade and then eliminate cardiac jelly. So you can almost imagine that it's, that's how the system is, is, is tuned by, he, by hemodynamic forces. That's a hypothesis right now. Go ahead. Pardon me. We haven't. Again, we're, you know, I have to say the, um, you, no, you're talking about in the mice, sorry. So, you know, right now, yeah, we kind of feel that the mice, we've established what's going on in the mice, and we've focused on the humans, and, I, and we're really just trying to get the actual biome samples from as many phenotype, genotype patients as possible. I think it'd be, you know, uh, Isam Awad, with whom we work pretty closely, he's a surgeon with a large CCM population, He's very interested in biomarkers, and, and it would be very interesting to see if some of these, you know, like proteoglycan degradation products or Adam TS proteases might serve as biomarkers for disease activity. But we, we haven't done that yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if you, if you were reading really quickly in that slide that had 20 different actual therapies, believe it or not, statins were proposed as a therapy for this disease before the relationship to KLF was established. And that trial was, has been halted because it's definitely not better and it might be making them worse. Um, I, we haven't looked specifically at patients with and without statins, and, but I think it's an interesting thing to do. I, it would be predicted to make things Ah, yeah, that's a really good question. So this is, you know, every time you make like a step forward in an animal model, you find a limitation. So our limitation right now is that we have a very robust model for lesion genesis in the neonate, but we cannot follow lesions very carefully. The reasons are Primarily, we can't generate lesions efficiently in the adult. And that's a very interesting question. We could talk about why later. Uh, we think it has something to do with a, a, re a requirement for some endothelial proliferative baseline. And without being able to generate adult lesions, we really can't follow them over time. But this is an important clinical question. The, the patients who, who, who are you know, following this they're not only interested in not making new lesions, they're interested in getting the hundreds of lesions they have to you know, not, not uh, you know, go away or, or not be symptomatic. So we don't know the answer yet. I, I just don't know. It's gonna be very interesting to see whether this is reversed. All right, thanks everybody. Stanford University.